Brand new designs are up on the Edge Redbubble, werewolves, spiders, FedEx amphibians, protocrocs, and more. Go check out the Redbubble with links in the description and comment section below. Easily one of the most underrated dinosaur groups are the Hadrosaurs. I can sort of understand that lack of appreciation if all you are familiar with are the most basic facts about them, or only know about the most boring of them. There's no shame in that of course, but there is a lot more to these animals than that. They are just as interesting as any other dinosaur group, or perhaps more so once you start down the Hadrosaur iceberg. There are sauropod-sized behemoths that would have given every tyrannosaur a run for their money. There were gorilla-armed, spike-thumbed varieties, and a parade of helmeted varieties that would have made the most unworldly sounds will never hear the way they were meant to be heard. But unfortunately, these guys have been stamped with the label of duckbills. I dislike that name. It's a very old name that harkens back to the days when people thought these wholly terrestrial animals were amphibious, dim-witted soup-eaters that sifted water plants from the swamps with their bills. Turns out, duck-billed dinosaurs really aren't duck-billed at all. The whole mess of lumping all the hadrosaurs into a duck-billed basket is all thanks to Edmontosaurus. What? Edmontosaurus, you say? The most boring of the hadrosaurs? No crests, no horns, no waddles, and just four legs, a beak, and a tail? Isn't that right? Edmontosaurus, despite its general lack of hard tissue crests like the trombone-headed Parasaurolophus, is way more interesting an animal than many give it credit for. They were up to 50 feet, 15 meters, with a ridge of rectangular bony or keratinous plates down their backs, hooved front feet, a huge deep tail that could break bones, fleshy rooster-like combs in some varieties, and of course, a huge noggin ending in a roughly duck or spoonbill-shaped snout. It's the main reason the hadrosaurs got the duckbill name, as it is one of the few with a vaguely rounded tip to the beak. A special specimen of Edmontosaurus, housed in the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History, shows that the beak shape we are most familiar with really isn't the full extent of their power. Sometime before 1970, famed paleontologist of the West Coast, Harley Garbani, took a team out to Fort Peck Reservoir in Montana to look for dinosaurs. They found a bunch of stuff, including a particularly good specimen of Edmontosaurus anectens, then named Anatosaurus anectens. The specimen was a rather complete skeleton that measures approximately 40 feet 12 meters in length. But what makes this specimen special is what was preserved on its face. Schmacked to the front of the skull is what looks like the keratin sheath that covered the bony parts of the beak when it was alive. At first glance, it looks like the actual beak covering, but upon further analysis, it turns out it's something quite different. As you can also see, part of the edge of it is gone. That's because of the workers who were preparing the specimen who figured it was just Matrix. That was until someone else pointed out what it was that was being chipped away. The beak-like extension is actually not the true beak, it's an internal mold. It was formed by sediments filling in the space between the true beak of the upper jaw and beak of the lower jaw. Those vertical fluted structures are therefore an impression made by the backside of the top beak, meaning Edmontosaurus beaks had a weird toothed or ribbed texture to the inside surface of their beaks. This also means the beak extended far beyond the impression that is left on the skull. This also means that the true beak shape of the Edmontosaurus wasn't really that duck-shaped and much more shovel-shaped, though I hesitate to call it that. There isn't really a good comparison or adjective to give besides, like, ruffles? Can we call it a ruffled texture? Okay, so we got a ruffled beak tadrosaur, no longer duck-billed. What does a ruffle beak help the animal do? Is it the only one? The guy who described this specimen in 1970 as part of the Los Angeles County Museum, William Morris, provided a long discussion of different hypotheses about the diet of the hadrosaurs. He noted that Edward Drinker Cope had figured the animals to be only capable of chowing down on soft water plants. This was based pretty much solely on Cope's assumption that the teeth were loosely attached to the jaws, which we now know is an incorrect assumption. Another pair of paleontologists, Richard Lull and Nelda Wright, 
then went on to compare the diet and lifestyle of the hadrosaurs to that of the living moose or alces, preferring to browse but switching to consuming soft water plants during certain parts of the year. Keep in mind that hadrosaurs were still considered huge amphibious duck-like animals that used their massive and powerful tails for swimming. A rare counter-narrative during this time was provided by paleontologist Jean Versluis. He strongly rejected the semi-aquatic duckbill hypothesis in favor of a strictly terrestrial habit, with hadrosaurs dining on bark, leaves, scrubs, trees, and uprooting plants. Who's to say if he thought they were horizontal horse-like animals like we do now? William Morris also noted a hadrosaur specimen that was found with preserved gut contents. At the time, this was the only known specimen with guts, so it was key to understanding what these critters were eating, but was also a sample size of one which could bias the truth. That specimen just so happened to have conifer needles in its gut. Researchers rightfully pointed out that conifer needles are more resistant to decay than soft water plants, so it remained a possibility that hadrosaurs could eat terrestrial plants, but preferred water plants. Obviously, the next half century plus would show that these animals really didn't have any anatomy that would suggest a semi-aquatic lifestyle whatsoever. Morris more or less agreed with the duck build stereotype and fit the ruffled beak texture into this hypothesis. Morris hypothesized that the fluting or ruffling of the backside of the top beak was quite similar to the laminations in the inner surfaces of the beaks of dabbler ducks, which used them to sift food from the water. Morris then went on to apply this to most other hadrosaurs, like Corythosaurus and Hypacrosaurus, which also had specimens found with beak molds. They were not as well preserved as this Edmontosaurus, and some were lost entirely, so they aren't great references, but do suggest something similar to Edmontosaurus. For example, Edward Drinker Cope described a specimen of a hadrosaur beak in 1883. Apparently, the specimen of the beak impression was destroyed during preparation of the skull. In Cope's description of the destroyed specimen, he didn't provide an explanation as to why or how it got destroyed. Morse suggested that it wouldn't be hard to believe that Cope thought his description would be good enough without need for visual aid or preservation of the structure. All that is really known about this specimen is that it comes from a skull of an Edmontosaurus. Unfortunately, as soon as I bring up a dickwad like Cope, I have to explain some things to give you context for the beak impressions he found, especially considering this is probably the earliest record of such a soft tissue hadrosaur beak impression. Cope wasn't the best scientist and would name a bunch of genera and species based on super fragmentary finds, like a collection of teeth or vertebrae. One can partially excuse this since the characteristics that differentiate dinosaur species or genera from one another were not as complex and well understood as they are today. But still, no one should name a new taxon on teeth alone. The only thing isolated teeth are good for is giving an indication of what kinds of animals were around in a certain sequence of rocks. Thankfully, the Edmontosaurus specimen Cope described in 1883 was one of the first relatively complete skeletons of a hadrosaur found, so it's a lot more than just teeth. Cope referred this skeleton to the genus Diclonius, which he had first named based only on teeth, back in 1876. He described the beak structures as like that of the lip or rim of some tea trays. They had vertical columns tipped in tooth-like projections, reflecting an undulated surface. Thanks to Cope's vague wording, researchers after him thought the undulatory surface and teeth were found on both the upper and lower beaks. Cope's wording was not exactly precise as to whether the parts he was describing were a mold of the beak or the beak itself. Therefore, he seems to have misinterpreted something rather similar to what is going on with the Los Angeles Edmontosaurus specimen. Cope implies that the structure he's describing is attached to the very tip of the lower jaw, which is more likely to be the rugose texture seen at the ends of the beaks of most hadrosaurs rather than the keratin itself, though it may also represent sediment that filled in the space and therefore preserves the real texture of the beak. Bruce Lewis, the other hadrosaur worker from the early 1900s, believed Cope's interpretation of the specimen as the true beak of the animal was incorrect, just like Morris did. Lull and Wright and even Dino Renaissance fire starter John Ostrom agreed with Cope's interpretation, though. 
Later on, Jean Versluis described another specimen of hadrosaur with something preserved on its beak. The Senckenberg Museum in Frankfurt, Germany had a specimen of Edmontosaurus anectens, then named Trachodon anectens, that had another beak impression. This one was a plate on the upper jaw projecting down 8 centimeters over the bony beak base. The surface texture is again described as undulating and alternating with small tooth-like projections. This one survived being prepared, and a plaster cast was even made of the beak structure. Morse interpreted it as another bill mold rather than the preserved bill itself. Finally, our last example is a specimen of the lower jaw of Corythosaurus excavatus, described by Charles M. Sternberg in the 1930s. This specimen is the lower jaw with what first appears to be the left half of the keratin sheath of the beak. This structure is again fluted but shouldn't be associated with the lower jaw as it is not attached to it. Instead, there is an amount of matrix separating the structure from the bony beak of the lower jaw. It could belong to it, but you can't be sure. Morris interprets this structure as yet another impression of the backside of the true beak of the skull or upper jaw. All of these specimens have therefore been interpreted as the texture of the backside of the beak that overhung the lower jaw's beak. The texture of the outside of the front is still unknown. I'd like to point out that Morris also provided a prescient speculation in his paper on the Edmontosaurus specimen. He suggested that the filtering device of the beak would have allowed hadrosaurs to consume large amounts of food free of water all at once. That included water plants, but also crustaceans and mollusks. It would take another 40-ish years before researchers would find hadrosaur coprolites with wood and crustacean remains in them, confirming they could, and potentially would, consume animal protein. With this specimen, we can be sure that at least the species Edmontosaurus anectens had a large, overhanging, ruffled textured beak. Some other hadrosaurs were probably similar, but with slightly different beak shapes that fit to their specific bony snout shapes. Far from sifting through Cretaceous primordial soup, hadrosaurs were terrestrial animals first and foremost. They used their batteries of small teeth to sideways grind their food into paste. Precisely how these Edmontosaur-type hadrosaurs used their huge mustache beaks remains a bit more unknown. Perhaps they used the ruffles to strip conifer needles off their branches, to crush up animal proteins, and snip through tough veggies. Despite these mysteries, one thing is clear. The duckbills were not duckbilled. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks goes to my elephant tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, Chris Frampton, Biotaverse, Arda Bayer, and Christoph Hubbinger, as well as my Tyrannosaur patrons, Iron Bladesman, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.